Recently, I had the opportunity to sit down with Franciscan author and theologian Daniel Horan. Father Dan is the author of many books, is a contributing writer at America Magazine, and travels all around the country speaking about Franciscan spirituality, the theology of John Duns Scotus, and the life and work of Thomas Merton. But I wasn't interested in any of that. No, the thing that interests me most about Dan is his age. Like myself, he entered religious life right out of college, was the youngest friar in our province for many years, and at 32 is the youngest priest we have. For myself then, as a millennial entering the religious life, trying to navigate this church, he seemed like the perfect person to talk to. What is it that our generation can learn from the church, and what is it that the church can learn from us? So Dan, I've been hearing a lot in the media and in our church this thing about the millennials, mm -hmm. you know, this generation. I've heard everything said about them. They, uh, they're interesting. They're, they're a new generation. They're the Ben Franklin generation, as I've heard. Not entirely sure what that means. <laughs> okay. I know that you've written about millennials, and both of us are in this generation. What the heck does it mean? Who, who, why are we so special? Yeah. Well, that's partly uh, one of the definitions. Some of the demographers, the people who study generations, uh, the more cynical, I would say, of the bunch, uh -huh. tend to say one of the characteristics of the millennial generation, and this was definitely the case with like the mid-breakout group, is that their self-perception is one of specialness. Uh -huh. Well, I am special. Well, exactly. And you're special. And, and, and what you do is okay, and what I do is okay, exactly. and what we don't do is okay. Mm -hmm. Everybody's okay. Yeah. And uh, you know, one of the, those character traits that, that I'm aware of is uh, you know, it arose because Gen Xers and others, I mean, the older Gen Xer generation, young baby boomers who happen to be our parents or mm -hmm. their generation, where like the helicopter parents, or the, oh, yeah. you know, now I guess they call it. You get uh, trophies for everything. Yeah, everybody's a winner. I mean, you you played sports, oh, so yeah. you. But I was had, a winner. Well, see, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, you're special. The rest of the folks, you know, <laughs> they're special too in their own minds. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so that's I think when we hear about millennials, we're usually talking about people born from like 1982 mm -hmm. to 2002, or like 1980 to 2000. When were you born? 89. 89. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So we're about six years apart. I was born in 83. Enough, yeah. 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 I thought you were younger. I thought maybe <laughs> maybe it's just because I'm balder. I don't that know. That might be. Like, <laughs> well, according right. to everyone at the parish I was at this summer, I was a 12-year-old. I was the oh, altar yeah. boy. Yeah. And you, you've shared that you've had stories like that, too. Right oh, when you were gosh. ordained, I think you said you were the altar boy in, in disguise or something like that. Yeah. I was at LBI, and uh, it was my first daily mm -hmm. mass on the schedule, and you know, in the back where the sacristy is, where people prepare the minister's talk, lecture's talk, Eucharistic ministers, we're getting ready to come out, and, you know, I'm vested, and the, out comes the server, out comes the lector, and then I pop out, right? <laughs> and we're getting ready to sing, and this little old lady in the back pew turns, and she looks, and she turns her head back, she shakes her head, and she goes, Pfft. Since when did they start letting altar servers say mass? So, <laughs> oh. Yeah, I know, and I, I, I've always thought, honestly, I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty bald. I thought that would make me look older. Yeah. Just makes me look like a big baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the only thing. That's all I can say. That's yeah. what you got to deal with, I guess. It's yeah. what God gave you. That's right. Well, and I have a theory about this. It's kind of interesting. I'm talking with people this summer, they all saw me as this little infant, and oh, aren't you cute in the <laughs> habits, and all this. And I. I mean, I'm, I am young looking, but looking at my friends, I look like other 26 year olds. And when I was in college, I looked like, I'm much younger then, and I looked like I was in college. And my question is, you know, are people just so far removed from a young person in the church? That's Someone like us, yeah. it's been 20 years maybe since then, and they're used to, um, you know, gray haired. Priests. Yeah, they see someone like us. So, well, they've just never seen someone in their twenties or thirties. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I think uh, you know that makes a lot of sense to me. I also think that we get desensitized in some ways because mm -hmm. we live in communities of of men that are much older than we are, right. and so uh, you know we look around and. Because we're not looking, well, I hope, maybe you do. I mean, you're the winner that, you know, and, and you said everybody gets a trophy and that sort of thing. Maybe you walk around with a mirror or a selfie stick or something all the time. So you're like, oh, yeah, I am young in comparison to this guy. But uh, my experience is I forget that I'm not 75. You know, I really do because, uh, and it's not an insult, it's not a bad thing. But I think we operate in a place where we're used to being around people that actually don't look very much our age. Mm -hmm. um, even in a house of formation like right. here in Washington, you know, there's a good mix of, uh, of guys of all different ages. 
And so, yeah, it's easy to forget. And then, meanwhile, everybody else is, is looking at the same picture, except they see us in right. the same group. And so, um, yeah, I also think your, your point about young religious is, is a key thing. You don't see it very often. But I have a, a kind of a theory, a mm-hmm. thesis about that. And it's not that there aren't a lot of young religious. There just aren't a lot of young people entering religious life in the way that we have something that's lasted 800 years or yeah. more. What we see a lot of, and, and you can tell me if this was your experience, um, you know, when I graduated from, from college in 2005, uh, there were two of us in my class that entered the Friars, uh, my classmate and myself. And uh, my roommate, I should say, of, of all four years, he discerned that it wasn't for him. He's now married. He got married. Yeah, we were just kids. talking about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, you know, in addition to the two of us, there were like a dozen people who are entering volunteer programs. Franciscan volunteers. Yeah, that is a good point. Jesuit volunteers. And I think that's something with our generation that has blossomed. Yeah. Is that there's a much more uh, a stronger focus on uh, service. Yes. You know, giving of ourselves. And so for me, it, it's. Um, really encouraging, but it's also, it seems a disconnect for me. You know, why are so many more people doing the same sort of things we do, yeah. but not joining us? Yeah, I mean, do you, do and you I have a thought say, about that? I mean, you sound, you sound disconcerted. And I think, no, yeah, well, well, I think it also needs a caveat in that we do get a lot more guys today than we did, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. There is kind of, you know, a vocation boom might be a little bit of an overstatement, but yeah. Uh, we've had more vocations in the last three or four years than we did in the last decade. And so that's encouraging. But we've seen a lot of people in the millennial generation coming to the church looking for stability, mm-hmm. looking for things like liturgy, looking for things like rules. They want order, you know, and they don't find order in the world. They don't find commitment. Yeah. And so they're seeking it in the externals of our church. You know, do, do you see that as well? I, I've heard that proposed... Um in the last several years as, as one of the theories for why there is, um, you know, you hear it's mostly anecdotal. There isn't a whole lot of actual statistical evidence to support it, but okay. we all hear these stories about yeah. so-called young clergy, young right. religious people our age, young priests, young nuns, yeah. who are, quote, more conservative or traditional. Right, they want to go back to the 1950s. You hear this kind of thing, mm-hmm. yeah. And I've heard it. I've heard different theories in, in different people who might be identified as folks who are in that kind of crowd. Maybe they're more inclined to wear their religious habits, or maybe if they're a seminarian or a priest, they wear, wear their Roman collar all mm-hmm. the time, or they like uh, to wear a beretta or something. Right. You know, which, for those who are watching, is a, 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 a used to be a traditional hat of, of Roman Catholic priests right. when they wore cassocks. It's it's super anachronistic today. Yeah. You wouldn't. No one wears it except yeah. for maybe the young generation. If, in other words, if you're wearing it, you definitely intended to wear it for whatever <laughs> reason. I don't know, yeah. but you, it was not an accident. Yeah. And so uh, I've heard some of them say, you know, oh, you know, we're not interested in turning back the clock, you mm-hmm. know, and going back before Vatican II or something. Um, but it has a different meaning for them or for other people. And so I think it's a complicated thing. But I have heard, as you're saying not just in Roman Catholicism or Christianity, the mainline churches, but we see this in other forms. You know, what is so attractive to a young adult, uh, a British person or a, an American, uh, somebody in, in, in Western Europe, for instance, that may travel to Syria to join ISIS? Like, how yeah. absurd is this, right? And one of the things I've heard is this hypothesis you're suggesting, too, which is, in a time where there is this instability in the career, in the world, in people's personal personal lives, um, you know, looking for something where people claim to have the clear answers. Right. I don't know. I I probably was, I like to think that I've moved somewhat beyond that. I think when I was younger, uh, in college, or maybe even younger than that, I definitely wanted to have the clear answers. I I wanted to say, you know, the Catholics are right no matter what. Yeah. You know. Franciscans are the best in this yeah. kind of thing. Well, maybe we should be you know, precise with this, because I, I yeah. posit it not necessarily as a bad thing, because I think there's some to good to that. There's something we can learn from mm-hmm. you know, finding our roots and going back to um, you know, some stability that we, we have in the church, focusing on some of these things. We also have some people that have externals for the sake of externals. You, know, right. you want to separate those. Myself, I find the habit to be a great way to evangelize, mm-hmm. you know, be able to go out and it expresses who I am, and it allows me to talk to people. Yeah. I've also met people that uh, want the habit because it 
uh, gives them a sense of empowerment. Look at how special I am. Right. Yeah. And they, they I, want a time in their minds that never actually existed. Yeah. Uh, and so you're making those distinctions of there is something that to be heard about that because you know we, we hear about you know liturgical abuses of the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. and you know pizza masses with soda. I don't know if those ever actually happened. Yeah. You know I hear these, these, these Oreos things. and stuff and it's like okay yeah. well when the evidence is produced. So, but you yeah. know, those were the extreme cases. But you know, there's lots of experimentation, and so mm -hmm. some people say, "Okay, well, I'm, I'm beyond that now, and I, I like, you know, let's go back to the patristic age, let's go to the med medieval, yeah. and let's go at our whole history of the church and say there's actually some really great ritual here, and there's nothing wrong with for myself being really interested in ritual, liturgy, externals, while at the same time social justice and the, you know the, sure. yeah. the the love of the church and being pastoral." Yeah. You know, is there a way that we can mesh those together? Absolutely. They're absolutely in no way anti antithetical. Like, they definitely come together. In fact, it's, it's the ancient patristic saying, lex orandi, lex credendi, that exactly. what we believe is what we pray. How we pray informs our belief, our creed. And at the core of, of the doxology is a, 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 an acclamation that God has entered this world and what God as us in relationship to us in this world shows us is precisely what we call in a modern time social justice, you know, mm -hmm. caring for one another, caring for the poor and the marginalized. So they're not at all separate. Um, the thing that I would say, though, is um, I, you know me, I'm a theologian, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, so for me it's, it's, about, uh, it's about people need to have the background. So if somebody says to me, I think we need to go back to our resources, to the, to the sources, to the earlier times, to the patristic tradition to the medieval times. Medieval times are not to be confused with that chain restaurant, medieval times, where sometimes we may be mistaken for <laughs> anachronistically. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think if somebody says, like, I want to wear the habit because it's tied to, it brings me back to this time, mm -hmm. right? And I'd be like, yes, but you should be wearing jeans and a t-shirt then because the mm -hmm. habit interesting, yeah. wasn't distinctive in Francis's time. What it did was associate him with the working class. Exactly. Why do we wear rope and not a leather belt like the monks? Because it's poor. It's it, because it's, yeah, what the day laborers mm -hmm. would have worn. We wear a tunic. Um, now, our it's a little different, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, obviously it's usually much more. a sackcloth. You maybe wool, something it coarse. Would have been, it, it, yeah, it would have been undyed, so it would have been like, it would have been pukey. It would have been like yeah. a variety, like various colors, different threads and stuff. Um, but the whole idea is that it would have been what the people in the fields would have working would have been wearing as they worked. What was charismatic and insightful about Francis of Assisi wasn't what he wore; it was yeah. who he was. It's not to this is not in any way to poo poo the habit. I wear it; it's part of our tradition and right. so on. But I th I think you know being back here in Washington the last couple of days, you know, especially in, in Maryland, you see a lot of day laborers, mm -hmm. many of whom are undocumented. Yeah. Those are the people Francis was with. What he was wearing is what they are wearing today for us. And so if we really want to identify, I'm not saying you in particular, yeah. but let's say somebody says, well, I want to wear this because it, it's got this tie back to the tradition and what it, quote, really means. What it really means is identification with the poor and most precarious of that time. So if we want to be like St. Francis, if we want to live his tradition in our apparel, we should be really wearing, you know, secondhand goodwill jeans, you know, T-shirts from you know, some sporting event in 1990 yeah. we never heard of or something, you know, and, and be with them. Um, that said, we don't live in Francis's time. And right. I think, and I think there's balance. something to the tradition, too. You know, there we is. as Franciscans right. are much more than just St. Francis. That's sometimes That's difficult. Right. Yeah. It, but we look at, you know, someone right behind us. Yeah. You know, Duns Scotus didn't know Francis, didn't live the same life that Francis did. Yeah. Even yeah. in Francis's time, you know, there were priests yeah. coming in. Yeah. priests, you know, that didn't really fit, you know, academics, yeah. you know, yourself, you're not a Franciscan, how can you call yourself yeah. a Franciscan? Yeah, look at Bonaventure and Alexander of Hales, you yeah. know, I mean, this was Very, a, a generation right afterwards, yeah, exactly. so I think there's something to that, to balancing who Francis was, but also right. who the order became immediately, you know, they helped, and you know, over the, the, um, the histories that we're identifying with, the whole history. Exactly. Um, so it, the question is, what, what is it, I think for me, what does it symbolize for us? Yeah. Does it remind us of our humility? Mm -hmm. um, does it remind us to be evangelical, which Francis very much was, always in the city streets, always uh, giving himself to be a preacher for God? Or does it remind myself that I'm part of the hierarchy, that I'm special, that I right. have authority over people? Yeah. Those are the questions I would ask myself. And yeah. as someone who's a very big supporter of wearing the habit, 
I don't necessarily think everyone should, because yeah. I don't think everyone brings with the right disposition, mm -hmm. and therefore I think it can be very detrimental. Because images are very important. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you see something, um, you subconsciously associate meaning with that. That's right. And so I've heard stories about people wearing the habit, and they say, "Oh, they were a terrible person," <laughs> and subconsciously they associate that with the church. Yeah, it should be being taken very seriously how we look how we act when we look this way. And so sometimes I think you're absolutely right. When we go out, we should be wearing ripped jeans and a, a t-shirt. Yeah, I didn't say anything about ripped jeans. This is oh, 1978. I mean, you're you're nice. saying yeah. we should look like the poor. <laughs> that's true. Actually, that's true. The ripped jeans would be in, so maybe... Yeah, uh, that's too fashionable. Yeah. Too fashionable. Yeah. We, should, we should have patches on them. Yeah, well, exactly. I, I think uh, what you said, we're, you know, it's not about Francis, and that's true. Francis made it very clear, uh, and it's true in the early hagiographies, that he didn't want everyone to repeat what he did. Right. But we do we should follow the one he followed. Exactly, not Christ, and that's another reason for us to be brought back to you know how did how did Jesus Christ two thousand years ago go about living and ministering in the world, yeah. um, not with titles or you know distinctive clothing and stuff. Um, yet today, we as ministers and, and have for a long yeah. time, uh, it becomes essential. It you know, becomes it's not just the it. external, but it becomes the, the main part. Yeah, yeah. And, and that becomes a problem when it's yeah. mistaken for, for the, the whole dealio, as, yeah. as the kids say. They don't say that anymore, do they? No, I don't <laughs> think so. You know, and tell me, we were talking about, you know, the early of the order. We were talking about Scotus, Bonaventure, yeah. Alexander of Hales. You yourself are a theologian. Um, when we're looking at the, the millennial generation, you wrote a book, you know, Dating God. And it was a good book. It relates well to people. Uh, you also wrote a book about SCOTUS that I will probably never read. <laughs> you and pretty much everybody else. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah. you yeah. know, justify yourself. Why waste yeah. so much time writing a book like that? Yeah, give an account of yourself <laughs> as, uh, as we read in the New Testament epistolary. You mm -hmm. know, we still have to give a, James, I think, is the one who tells us we have to give an account of our faith. Exactly, yeah. Um, so this guy right here, to my right, I'm, I'm just so <laughs> grateful that, that Casey has set up this our conversation in front of uh, I hope to someday say Saint John Dutton. Maybe. He's blessed, He's blessed right now. now. Um, so the, the book is, it is very academic. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very, very specific and admittedly probably boring to most people <laughs> topic about a very, very difficult thinker who is scapegoated by some contemporary difficult thinkers. Mm -hmm. The reason I, I wrote that is because even though 99.9998% of the population will never even hear of SCOTUS or mm -hmm. right now think we're talking about the Supreme Court, yes. the Franciscan contributions that he makes in terms of theology, in terms of how we understand ourselves, how we understand God, how we understand Mary, how we understand the reason for the Incarnation, how we understand creation and the world we live in, all these things have like a trickle-down effect. And I think that we can learn a lot from his insights as much as we could from like Thomas Aquinas mm -hmm. or from Bonaventure, who's kind of in between the two. He's yeah. more popular than Scotus, but not as popular as Tommy, everybody's homeboy. Fat Tommy. Yeah, yeah, he's a big dumb ox, you know, <laughs> as he'd like to say of himself. Um, and so, yeah, you know, there's, for me personally, in terms of my vocation as I understand it, I try to balance these things. There's a need to speak within the academy to mm -hmm. specialists and other theologians and to do that kind of academic research, and that's what the SCOTUS book is yeah. kind of about. But you mentioned dating God or you know some popular articles and these kinds of things, and that's because I think theology is important. It can be life or death important, and that it needs to reach a broader audience. And so all people should have access to our rich tradition, in the Franciscan tradition. You know these guys were big time thinkers. Who are inspired by some tiny little Umbrian, uh, you know, Umbrian being the region in Italy because Italy didn't exist then. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy Francesco de Bernardone, I mean, this little guy Francis, uh, who continues to inspire us. And I'm yeah. like, we need to. Gives you some that. humility for sure. It does. But it also shows you, like, anybody can make a difference. Yeah. You know, everybody thinks of Francis or they think of, you know, I don't even know, even Pope Francis as, like, these exceptional people. They're just ordinary people. And what are they doing? You know, they're not using incredible skills. They're not incredibly gifted with, you know, mind or athletic ability. No. They're just loving freely. I mean, what did Francis do? He lived the gospel. He man. lived the gospel. And that was our rule. You yeah. know, the first line is to live the gospel. And he probably didn't want anything else, no other rules beyond that, because what more could there be? Yeah. He wanted to live among the lepers, mm -hmm. to give up everything he had, and just to love. Yeah. Why is that extraordinary? Uh -huh. It's... 
it's just it, it's the gospel. What could be better than the gospel? I think we add so much to it. We need so much more. Well, the adding so much to it is exactly what Pope Francis says in the joy of the gospel. Mm. He says, you know, it's so simple. The words of, of Jesus are so direct. The gospel yeah. message is clear. And then he asks, why complicate something that's so simple? And it's an easy answer because it's too hard. We don't want to do <laughs> it. Right. Jesus says, you know, you're going to suffer. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be difficult. Uh, people aren't going to like what you have to say when you challenge you know, the institutions, mm. you challenge a politician, for example, that says people don't have the right to unionize and to work together to, to yeah. earn a d decent wage, and you say, that's not just. Which is absolutely our Catholic teaching, it is. to step up and say, yeah. you need to stop this. And to this stand isn't just. with the people, yeah. the workers that you were talking about earlier, who mm -hmm. are trying to make, a, you know, just a living. And you know what? The big money and power is not going to like that. No. You know? and, but, uh, so yeah. talk about that, though. I mean, we're, we are, um, you know, we're young religious. Uh, we're a part of the hierarchy yeah. of sort. You know, we, we are the institutional church. And so in some ways, uh, we have the great tradition of the church to speak to, to truth to power, to the economy, to politics. But in some ways, we are the power. Uh, and so how do we handle that of, you know, we want um, the church to... Uh, to hit standards as well, and mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we have some difficulties. I mean, do you gr agree with everything that's ever come out with the church? Do we have to? Um, How do we handle that? So many questions. Yeah. Uh, no, no, and no. Yeah. Uh, we don't have to, just to, not to scandalize everybody, mm -hmm. but there is, in, in the social media age and, and 24 news network age, uh, where things get communicated so quickly and so fast, there's this impression that uh, everything is infallible when the church actually has a rich, gradated tradition of exactly. what's called the hierarchy of truth. And so some things are dogmatic, you know. Jesus is fully God and fully human. you got to believe that. Like that's If part you don't, of I wonder why you want to be in the church anyway. Well, you know, the thing is, it's not a matter even if we want to or not. If you're baptized, you are the church. Exactly. Paul says the body of Christ is the church, all those who are baptized. But, yeah, you're right. It's like, well, what are we really doing here if that's mm -hmm. not the case? There's got to be something to bind us together. Yeah, yeah, and, and there is a fellowship, a koinonia, a communion yeah. um, that's shared in a lot of different ways, one of which is what we profess to believe, for sure. Um, another thing is, you know, the, the community itself, you know, when we gather together. But, um, you know, not everything that, the, that we teach as a community, as the body of Christ, which is the church, or is promulgated by our, our respective pastors, the bishops, um, needs to be assented to in the same way. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Yeah, it's complicated um, without getting into like a moral theology right, class. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there, there are some things that are most closely proximate to Scripture as the foundation. So things like um, the Incarnation, things like the Trinity. The Resurrection. The Resurrection, yeah. These sorts of things are what we might call in technical language dogmatic. Mm -hmm. But then there are doctrines that are expressed in varied ways. And then there are defined teaching. So uh, encyclical letters, uh, official okay. teaching of, of popes in their ordinary magisterium, that is defined teaching that we have to assent to. Yeah, that was a big question this summer. Do I have to follow Laudato Si? Yes. Do I have to follow Humane Vitae? Yes. <laughs> Do I have to follow, you know, the, some of the things right after the Second Vatican Council? Yeah. There's all these questions. Yeah. The Pope says it. Some people say, well, it says it, so I have to follow it. And some people say, well, Not I exactly. don't. Exactly. And that's yeah. where it gets tricky. So um, people like Benedict XVI, mm -hmm. the Pope Emeritus, he's a brilliant theologian. Uh, and he, even as Pope, as Bishop of Rome, he was, because he knows the tradition, he knows theology, he knows how to make these distinctions clearly, he would publish a book on Jesus, for instance, mm -hmm. in Jesus and Nazareth, and he would say, I'm writing as a private theologian. This is not the teaching of the church in my office as Bishop of Rome. But his predecessor, John Paul II, was not as good about that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. John Paul II, whether intentionally or otherwise, he kind of was bigger than life. Yeah. And you know, we remember, he was our first pope. You know, I was millennial. Right. But um, he gave the impression and never tended to specify or correct people who thought anything John Paul II says is absolute teaching. Right. And I see that among people who read him, too, because he'll yeah. write that he wrote things before he became Pope. That's right. And they'll forget to call him Carol Bartia said this. Yeah. They'll say, oh, Pope John Paul II said it. Yeah. Well, technically, no, he didn't. Well, and even if he did say it, you know, what Pope Francis says today in a homily, mm -hmm. like he'll say in a couple hours in yeah. you know, Roman time in his morning daily mass, 
is not of the same level as what he would say in an apostolic exhortation. Right. And that's not at the same level as an encyclical. Right, and there are many different levels. Exactly. So we have something in our hearts that we just we struggle with. You know, I think you know, both of us could say there are things in the church that um, fit well with us, and there are things that make us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. How do we navigate that? Do we just say, well, I follow my conscience and I never do anything I don't want to do? Yeah. Or do we say, well, the church says I have to do it, so I have to do it, and I just give up my conscience? How does that interplay yeah. work? So there's, um, that's such a great question, and it's so important because a lot of people don't know exactly, yeah, that's the big struggle. It seems so black and white, either or. And then you hear this kind of pejorative language, cafeteria Catholic. Uh, yeah. It's such a horrible way to talk about these things. What, the, what we teach, what the tradition teaches within the church is that we are called to assent morally to certain things. There's a Latin phrase called obsequium religiosum. No idea. I know. It just means that we lift our, our heart and our, our mind, our thoughts, to the teaching of the church. And if we struggle within our conscience, if we have a difficulty accepting a clearly defined teaching, I'm not talking about... Pope Francis says something in a homily. I'm talking about something in an encyclical. Case in point would be Humana Vitae okay. or Laudato Si or mm -hmm. something like this. If I am having a difficult time with that, what I'm called to is to publicly assent to it, to lift up, uh, to offer kind of like a religious assent. And with the hope that I would work to try to understand better why mm -hmm. the church teaches what it does. What is the meaning behind it? What is its depth? Because I think a lot of times people, I mean, let's be honest, I hear this all the time. Nobody reads the encyclicals. Like, everyone's like, Humana Vitae this, Humana Vitae that. I'm like, have you read the text? Yes. Probably not. <laughs> and for those who hate it, there are some wonderful things in there that everyone there are, would agree with. There are. And Paul VI, you can see in, in the document itself, especially at the end when he's addressing clergy and ministers in the church, he says, you have to deal with these things with such an extreme pastoral sensitivity. Yeah. And in there, there, there is room for accompanying people with this difficult teaching. He's very clear about that. But people don't, and, and this includes priests and religious, uh, they don't oftentimes do the homework that's mm -hmm. needed to understand it. So what, what we're required to do is, if it's not something that we readily assent to right away, it's something that we commit ourselves to, in a public way, assenting to but maybe need to seek out personal uh, resources in terms of learning more about it, talking in spiritual direction, talking to our pastors, talking to an entrusted member of, of, of our faith community, and to try to understand better, and that's what we commit ourselves to. So but, what you're saying is that if we disagree with something, we don't, our first reaction is not to voice our opinion publicly, how much we hate this, but yeah, maybe yeah. Mm -hmm. try it on a little bit. You can yes. still hold, it, hold on to you know, difficult feelings, but... You say, well, I, I trust the church, at least to the extent that I'm going to look into it. Uh, and I, I think I find a lot of this, well, maybe you do as well, in our life as friars with obedience. Mm -hmm. You know, obedience is also a misunderstood one. That yeah. Does it mean that anything our guardian says we have to do? Well, in a sense, <laughs> well, yes. Joe's listening through the wall, <laughs> then the answer is yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. You know, in, in a sense, it is yes, but in a sense, it is no. Yeah. You know, we're not going to publicly... Uh, disagree, or we're not going to publicly make them look terrible, or publicly whatever it may be. You know, if the guardian asks us of, us of something, we're going to try to do it, and then maybe we talk to them afterwards and say, "Well, I'm really struggling with this. Maybe you can see it a different way." But it's not top down. You will do this without any discussion. That's right. And it's also not. Well, I, I just don't feel like it. Yeah. And there have been times in my life as a friar that being forced to do something that I didn't want to do actually opened my eyes to something that was actually wonderful that I'd never seen before. That's right. I think there's, there's a great gift in letting go of our will and just kind of trusting someone else. And you know, maybe we don't follow blindly. No. You know, we obviously go you know, intellectually, we go critically into these things. But there's another part where we just say, well, I'm not the Lord of everything. Yeah. And sometimes just giving up my own authority for little things can be a good step for the big thing, which is giving up our will to God. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a good way to describe it, and and to take seriously what obedience literally means. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we use this word literally. It's something. Yeah. Speaking of millennials, people mm -hmm. literally use literally too much. Never, never use it. I know um, it's so misunderstood, um, but. In, its, in the word's literal meaning, in its mm -hmm. origins, it's, it's all about hearing. Obediare is to listen. Mm -hmm. And so when we profess a vow of obedience, it's, it's a vow of 
our willingness to listen to the will of the community, the common good. Um, you're right. It's not. We're not in the military. And there are some religious orders that are more military esque. Right. Uh, not mentioning any names, but their you know name rhymes with the Shemamayadi of Mises, <laughs> and their leader was from Spain and was a soldier who recovered from a camp. Right. I have no idea who you're talking no, about. No. 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 So you know, you know, some tend to have a sense of, of obedience mm-hmm. in the way that we popularly think, like you will obey me, like your parents right. might say. I've heard that if you're in that society, <laughs> uh, whichever one it would be, <laughs> if the uh, the general were to come to you and t- tell you to take out your cell phone and throw it on the ground, that you would be bound to do that. <laughs> yeah. Not anywhere yeah. close to ours. No, no, I think, I, yeah, I don't know about that, yeah. but <laughs> I certainly, is. I think I'd say, oh, maybe this isn't right for me, mm-hmm. but. But yeah, there's a difference, definitely a different right. spirit, a sense about it. And then going back to the, you know, can you assent or do you have to agree to everything in kind of a direct, immediate way and in a black or white way? Right. This is where, um, you know, the, the Second Vatican Council is Gaudium et Spes, I believe, if not Lumen Gentium, that teaches or re, it reiterates a long standing teaching, 2,000 years old, that the primacy of the conscience comes first in moral decision making. Mm. And so a well-formed conscience is what's supposed to guide us. And there are times when somebody's teaching something or it's being expressed in a way that's not good or it doesn't align with our right. personal experience. And that's where the church does say, it's repeated in the catechism, it's in the highest teaching of the church in the conciliar document, that, that we are to you know, re- reserve that right and listen to the voice of the Spirit echoed in our heart and our conscience. Um, but the key is not to go around, like you were saying, with obedience to the guardian. You don't want to go around bad-mouthing people right. and being disrespectful. Um, but it, it's challenging to Yeah, do. I think there's a tension in me that, you know, I think the, the church is living. It mm-hmm. is moving. It's not, it's some, despite what some people think, that it's never changed. It changes a lot. Oh, yeah. You know, some of its core dogmatic things, as we said, probably don't change no. ever. But, you know, a lot of the, our expressions change a lot. And so sometimes uh, we need to be called, particularly as religious, but certainly the laity, to challenge the church, mm-hmm. to, to get up with the, the t- signs of the times as the Second Vatican Council said. Mm-hmm. The other part of me, the intention with, yeah, I'm a 26-year-old guy that knows nothing. Yeah, you so know, learn something. Do I, know, I, do I know what Augustine <laughs> knows? Do I know what Aquinas knows, yeah. Bonaventure? You know, and some, the people who run the church. There's a little trust there. Mm-hmm. So how do I balance trust with, well, you know, you need to hear the new voice, and this is where the millennials are that you know, they are a new voice, we are a new voice, that didn't go through the same experiences that Generation X and Y did, and so therefore may not have the same know-how, but certainly have a different perspective. And that perspective, uh, I think, is worth hearing. I don't know if we necessarily hear it as much. I don't, I don't know about you. I think a big thing that we can do is empower people in the millennial generation um, to have this tension, not one or the other, but to learn from the church, but then also to not be afraid to step up and say, well, could we do it a different way? Yeah, yeah I think that's right. Um, we are called, again, you know, Paul says in, in the New Testament time and again, when talking about the church, talking about the body of Christ, he uses the bodily images, right? He says, just because you're an ear doesn't make you better than a foot. Don't say right. that you are, and this kind of thing, that we're all part of the body of Christ working together. And how quickly we forget that. One of the things I find so refreshing about Pope Francis is that he understands what his responsibility is as Bishop of Rome, first and foremost. And that's he's a baptized member of the body of Christ, first and foremost, like the rest of us. When he dies, people are shocked to hear me say this sometimes, when he dies, God isn't going to give a crap about the fact that he was Pope. (laughs) That's not impressive. What's impressive is, and he's recognized as, who he was baptized as on that day. Little Jorge Bergoglio. Right, yeah. little Casey Cole, little Dan Hurran. Mm-hmm. That's how God knows who we are, and do we live up to what God has called us to be in our circumstances? Now, it's going to matter if He lives with fidelity, His mm-hmm. His call to be, you know, a bishop, to be a, a priest, to be Bishop of Rome, and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's not um, it's not so clear cut at times, and that we all need to have a voice. The Spirit speaks through the Church, and there there's. Theological language, technical language for that, the census fide or census fidelium, you know, this is a question that I think we need to be open to considering. Does the experience of the faithful, which has theological value, is that actually being listened to in response to some of the decisions that are made by a few of our leaders that we do trust um, and that are certainly inspired by the Holy Spirit? But uh, yeah, I think that we need to hear from each other from new generations, from 
older generations, whatever it may be. And I think there's an experience among a lot of people on all kind of ecclesiastical and political spectrums, all sides of the spectrum, that, uh, that people are jaded. And they're like, you know, it doesn't matter what my experience is. Nobody cares, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you see it on both ends. You see people who are like, um, you know, they want, they think the church is too liberal or, or the people who think the church is too conservative and everything in between. And I think what you said is exactly right. You know, people, um, it, it's not a democracy. Mm-hmm. You know, the church is, is our way of trying to form a community where we build each other up, as St. Paul says in Romans, and try to encourage one another to help announce and, and to help initiate the kingdom of God. Through our actions, you know, uh, a friar in our province, you know, Jim Scullion, right? Of course, yeah. Yeah, uh, he was one of my scripture professors a hundred years ago, and uh, one of the things I'll never forget is him talking about the uh, the Our Father, the the prayer of, of the church is our prayer, and he says, you know, when we pray, Thy kingdom come. The answer to what that kingdom looks like is in the next line. It's when Thy will is done, and. You know, I think that's what we should be focusing on. Are we living the reign of God as Jesus did? You know, going back to you, what you said so well earlier about Francis always pointing to Christ. You know, we follow the one that he follows, um, but we we don't act that way so often. Man. Yes. So we're we're talking about this generation that has a lot to offer and also has a lot to learn. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're we're in a, a really interesting and kind of a pivotal time of the church. You know, Francis is bringing. Uh, kind of ushering in a new way of thinking, at least I've seen this among some of the bishops, that uh, really taking hold of this mercy of God Mm -hmm. and this pastoral care and still holding on to the teaching and the tradition of the church and have that nice blend that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. How do we encourage millennials? How do we listen to millennials? Mm -hmm. I I think there's a lot that they can offer. Yeah. Yeah, so I think one of the things that comes to mind today is the... um, happens to be, as, as we know from, from evening prayer tonight, the anniversary of the death of a wisdom figure, a friar who used to live in his house, yeah. Father Juniper. And he always used to say about vocations, something that I think applies to what it's like uh, when it comes to our relationship to our fellow generation members in the mm-hmm. church today. He used to say, you know, it's not about advertising. It's not about, you know, marketing or recruiting or anything. It's like, if you are happy, if you're living the life and you're happy, people will know. Mm. And if that's well, something they want, they'll follow. And I think that's the same for us, too, in terms of ministry. Um, I think thinking in terms, I know there are all sorts of good ways to talk about leadership and, and you know, effective pastoral leadership and stuff, and that's important. But in terms of like on-the-ground leadership, I think of what Brother Juniper said, which is, you know, we accompany people. We live the gospel. We're there. We meet people where they are. We don't tell them all the answers. We might engage in conversation if they have questions. And I think that's where we begin. And we need to be obedient, not just to our religious superiors, but to live that vow of obediare in the people we meet, including our friends and our strangers who are our age or younger or older. You never know when Jesus is going to appear to us through our, you know, our brothers and sisters. Is with Always. the poor. Yeah. Always, mm-hmm. exactly, yeah, and so I think as we accompany them, that's that's my thought anyways, is like, you know, WWJD, what would Juniper do? And there you go. You know, and he'd probably have a beer and uh, <laughs> tell a dirty joke. Okay, and, maybe not a good start. Yeah, oh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Be, yeah. Yeah. Maybe you did. That's okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I think there's something to that, you know, yeah. listening, being with the people, being with people where they are. Um, and being real, I think, is Juniper's whole thing. Being yeah. real. Being real. Exactly. And that's yeah. what the church needs. Exactly. You know, we, we don't need to fool people into something it's not. No. Um, we don't need people to come in with all the answers. Absolutely. There's something the church can offer, and there's certainly that something that people can offer it. Yeah. Amen. For more interviews like this and the Ask Brother Casey segment, be sure to check out the rest of the page and click here to subscribe. You can also check out my blog at breakinginthehabit.org and follow me now on Facebook, Casey Cole OFM.